Oh, that's much better. <clears throat> All right, 204. Once you get that, if you'll please stand. I would like to ask the man with the good vocal cords to go ahead and pray for us. Quietly. <laughs> that's impossible. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for who you are and the wonders you perform in our lives, Lord. And just pray for this week as evangelists and his wife come, the hustlers, and just pray for strength for Pastor and Sister Vivian <coughs> as they do all the things to get ready. And Lord, tonight, as we come to your word and sing your praises, may we, may our heart be in it, and may we thank you from the bottom of our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 204, turn your eyes upon Jesus. <clears throat> Oh, 
Sometimes you don't actually make it on time when you, when you uh, think you're going to make it. <clears throat> this is not a situation where she has to be exactly on time. <coughs> so, <clears throat> but we are concerned. And also, uh, we need to pray for Brother Hustler as he um, travels. <clears throat> he <clears throat> he gave me his traveling according to his time there, and I'm afraid that just doesn't help me a bit because of the time difference, so I can't tell you exactly where he's at. I do not have his flight numbers, but uh, I did uh, text him some today, and he just asked for some pertinent information, like, where are you at? You know, <laughs> Well, this is my address. So anyway, just pray for them. Um, long haul, a lot of things uh, to be accomplished in the time he's here. Not just here, but as he's over on this side of the earth. So. Uh, do pray for, for them that they would come in rested or get rested pretty quick because they have to hit the ground running. I <clears throat> want to um, also make you aware of the sign-ups, the ladies' lunch. That is going Dutch. You will be responsible to pay for your own meal. you got the men's fellowship. Um, <clears throat> we're just going to have toast and peanut butter. But anyway, come on, <laughs> and we can have a good time. Have I ever, have I, yep, i got a few of you look at me real strange. I've never upset you. I've, I've always kind of had something decent for you. Um, anyway, we'll see how it goes. And uh, of course, we have uh, our Thanksgiving uh, potluck this uh, coming Sunday. So do, if you haven't signed up, uh, sign up for something. And, you know, I just want to say this again. I've said it before. I don't know that people realize how important it is to sign up. 
It's very important to sign up, and it's very important that if you sign for something, that you bring what you sign for. Um, sometimes people are signed for, for something, and then when they come, they, it's totally different, and there's three or four of those items. And we actually, Vera and I, mostly Vera on this, she watches that pretty close, and if there's something seems to be something missing, we try to fill that in. And so when we don't know, well, what you don't know, you don't know. You know, you can't respond to what you don't know. So it is a, it is a help. <clears throat> and I wish you'd just keep that in mind, that uh, whether you sign up or not, and, and whether you bring what you've signed up for, does, uh, does have a bearing, and it is important. And so anyway, I'm not meaning to, I'm not trying to, 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 to admonish you or anything, I'm just trying to let you know. And so um, if you would, go ahead and turn to page 208, 208. You know, it always surprises me um, on potlucks. I was telling Vera, we, we come in here two potlucks in a row and, and there was so much desserts and so much little food. I was like, wow, look at all the desserts. And then it turns around, next time you have all this food and no desserts, I'm like, whoa, because you never know. Potlucks are actually potlucks, are they not? And this is a little different. So, But God has always been sufficient, hasn't he? There's always been plenty here. And so praise the Lord for that. God is good. And I do appreciate that. And, and by the way, as long as we're doing that, I'm not going to worry about making any hot dog soup. So we're good to go. 208, once you turn to that, and if you please stand, <clears throat> are you washed in the blood? <clears throat> I said I'm not I'm not trying to to um, uh, to be uh, put pressure on or anything I was just kind of being uh, informant um, you know I, I, I always well I won't say that never mind we're not I'm not getting into that anyway <clears throat> Colossians chapter 3 Colossians chapter 3 um, we had uh, got down into two um, <clears throat> I do appreciate you praying for me. I am getting a little bit better piece by piece. <clears throat> it's been a while. You know, um, the first uh, the first two Sundays of this thing, I didn't think I was going to be able to talk at all. I thought I was going to lose my voice. Now, the second two, 
I seem to be hovering between heaven and earth. I don't know. But anyway, it's getting better, and I do appreciate your prayers. I've tried about everything to speed it up, but I don't think anything's working. It's just an endurance test. So if I can take my voice. I just don't know if you can. But anyway, so we're in chapter 3, and, and we were, like I said, we had talked about the, the seek those things which are above and where Christ sitteth. And then we talked about in verse 2, set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. And we were still in that, actually. Um, you know, I had mentioned there, there's a change that must take place in the believer's heart. There's a need to be transformed. You know, when I was in college, when I first went to college, they, they said you have to wear a tie, you get demerits, you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to show up for this class or that class. And, and I hated ties, and I hated, uh, I really didn't like a schedule so much. Um, uh, I had my own, but, you know, you have to adapt to somebody else's. And I, I found that there's a need to conform. I, I had a whole book of uh, rules in college that I had to conform to. Now, what's conformity? What is it? What does it mean to conform? Doing what's, expected. Doing what's expected. It's not that you like it or anything, but you conform. Now, I did it long enough that I finally transformed. I mean, and when I say transformed, it became second nature to me. It wasn't any problem. And, and I, I use that illustration to say uh, there has to be a, a change that takes place in the believer's heart. That first part of that change is when we uh, come to know Jesus Christ as personal Savior. But it has to go further than that. So you have uh, things when you first get saved that you conform to. But there must come a time when you become transformed. You must take on the image of Christ. And we can't do that generally all at once. We do it little by little. But we also, part of that, and I think that's what they're pointing to in 1 and 2, seek those things which are above, set your affection on things above, is to take and, and not conform, but to actually transform our our minds from one of this world to the one of the next world, from from carnality to godliness. Um, and, it, and it can only occur <clears throat> as we are saturated with the things of God, by setting our affections on, by seeking these things, we saturate ourselves. If you're not willing to invest in a personal relationship with God, you're not going to have one. It's just not going to happen. You have to invest. <clears throat> and like I say, as we invest, we begin to, to spend more time in it, <coughs> we become saturated, if you would, or should be. Now, the next question I had in my mind was, how do we know that we're seeking the things of God? And, and I think I mentioned this. I think we went through this. We talked about, um, uh, do we crave uh, the things of God? When it says, set your affection on the things, and it, 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 has, it carries the idea of, um, when I say crave, uh, how many of you have ever craved to eat something? Now, okay, all the women probably, um, or pretty much. But you understand what I'm saying. Sometimes you get in your mind, there's just something I would really love to have. You know, I haven't had this in so long. It was like I told you about the steak. I said, you know, Lord, everybody else is eating steak. Why can't I just have a little piece? You know, man, I would love to have peace so much. And then God began to give me all that. And I was like, wow. God's really, but, but you crave something, you want it so bad. And so the idea here is that uh, we have to question ourselves. Do we really crave to be like God? You know, and, and let's take that crave and, and define it as hunger and thirst. The Bible tells us a lot about hungering, thirsting after the things of God. And, and do we do this? Um, do we have a mind uh, or to be righteous, or do we have the mind of God that we won't want to be righteous like Him? Um, <clears throat> if we're not craving the things of God, if we're not hungering, thirsting after the things of God, then how are we ever going to grow in Christ? How will our lives ever become uh, pleasing to God? Why, why, why would we? Uh, let me rephrase that. How would we ever fulfill the will of God for our lives if we're not willing to, to invest hunger and thirst? Uh, and, and again, let's go back to the craving, the hungering, and the thirsting. What does it mean to hunger after something? Uh, I, there's something here that I, I, I need in me to satisfy me. And that thirst, do you remember what I said about thirst? What does that mean to thirst? When you get hungry... If you don't eat for a while, what happens? That hunger will go away. If, you, if you've never fasted 
After the first day, it gets easier. After the second day, it gets really easy because your body is now in a mode of uh, starvation mode or whatever you want to call it, so it, it conserves. And so you don't hunger as much. Matter of fact, it's very easy uh, the third and fourth day, it's just, it's really not a whole, whole lot to it. And I can't tell you much after that. But thirsting is different. Once you begin to thirst, it's impossible to quench. Hunger goes away, but thirsting does not. So we need to hunger uh, for the Word of God. We need to f- have ourselves filled with the Word of God. But we also need that thirst. I don't uh, think we should ever stop desiring, thirsting. Uh, we should never actually be totally quenched for our desire for the Word of God. Satisfied? I don't have a problem with saying satisfied. But to quench that thirst, no. I think you also all should always should hunger and thirst. Or uh, let me rephrase that: we should always thirst uh, to be like Him, to have Him in our lives. Um, <clears throat> if we don't, if there's no thirst. Uh, which is really the one I'm looking at more so because it doesn't go away. If there's no thirst to be like God, then then are we really gods? Are we really children of God? <clears throat> I could see, and let me just give a little difference. I can see where um, and you're reading your Bible every day and, and then something happens and you miss it. And then, you know, well, I didn't get a chance to, to, to get that Bible reading done today. And maybe, you know, in a couple of days you miss another one. And, and as that picks up, that desire to meet with God in the morning is gone. Because the hunger is, you know, you've been along uh, away long enough. But there should be something in you that you can't satisfy. It's missing. And I think that's the thirst. Now, again, that's, that's how I see it. You may see it differently. But I do believe you need to hunger and thirst. <clears throat> Likely, <clears throat> if you don't, you probably continue to set your your heart on the things of this earth. Um, I'll leave that for now. We may come back to that. I may not. Uh, but I, I just want to talk about, I want to give you a story I heard from a man. And he's, um, in his day, he actually, uh, God used him as a missionary and as a pastor. He actually, uh, at a very young age, had a very large church um, that he just, pff, the pastor passed away and the assistant, something happened there. And so they called him as a youth a very young man in his 20s, to take this church. And I was talking with him one day with another pastor, and he, he told me this story. He said um, in his first ministry as a very young age, you know, he had a large amount of people, and this is the statement he said. He said, I would be in my study begging God for a message. He said, I needed something to preach, and I had nothing. And understanding when he took this church, he also ended up with a, um, a radio program. <laughs> so he had a radio program and four sermons a week and he told me he was actually preaching in other places so he was preaching about six times a week plus he had that radio So, and he's a young man hadn't been out of Bible college that long and, and can you imagine being in that position the pressure on you I would say him sitting there begging I'm thinking boy that would create a thirst for the things of God for that relationship you know I want to get close I want, I want God to to overshadow me. But is that not the mindset that we all should have to be begging God for something? You know, we shouldn't be satisfied with the life we now have. We should be uh, desiring more to, to have a greater life, to have, walk closer with, with God. Um, there's another instance in Scripture I think of when I think of this. Do y'all remember who Rachel is? The wife of Jacob? You remember Leah had kids and she did not? Do you remember what she said to Jacob? And she said, give me a child or I die. And Jacob got mad. He says, who am I? Am I God? But should we not also have that? Lord, give me a relationship with you. Give me something. I'm going to die. And you're right, you would. Spiritually, you'll die if God doesn't give you something. God needs to give us something every day. You say, well, that's kind of hard, isn't it? No, it's easy. If you go looking for something from God, and I'm talking spiritually, I'm not talking about houses or money or anything, <clears throat> but will he not give you that? What do you think? What does God want for you? God wants you to grow spiritually. He wants you to grow closer with him. So if that's God's desire for you and you're praying according to his desire, would he not do it? And so that's the key. 
You know, we we not to pray for just anything, but to pray for things according to His will. And I think one of those is to to pray, Lord, give me something or I die. The urgency, the conviction to to have that. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're, we're back to talking about set a little bit um, before I get too far away. So they they seek these things, but then they're to set their affections. And and for me, when I think about <coughs> the setting. I think about beginning to think about the things of heaven. I begin to think, you know, often I think about who will be there. What will my future home be like? You know, what, who, who the, of my family that's gone before and, and, you know, in my family, there's a few preachers, just a few uh, that have uh, from, from years ago that were gone. And I said, you know, will, will I know them? Will I be able to see them? You know, what will my relationship be? How will that work? Uh, what will be there? You know. You know, you hear about the streets of gold, you hear about Christ, you hear about God. Um, it's the new Jerusalem. What will it be like? And so begin to think. Uh, Christ will be there. And so will all those um, uh, in Christ, everyone that's ever been saved. Now, you go back and look through Fox's Book of Martyrs. You look through these books that talk about all these uh, ones we would consider missionary heroes or, or preachers from the past that know Christ. They will be there. What a blessing that will be, you know. So I think about those things. I'm beginning to look forward to that day, that day when I'll be there. And I, I think of Revelation when it talks about uh, God high and lifted up, and it gives that description. And I'm thinking, what will, what will it mean to be at the foot of that throne and see God? I think your knees will bend, your head will bow. I don't think you have any choice. I think the, just the awesome majesty of God alone will, will humble you so much you quickly do that and so i do you know family friends loved ones biblical people these of these affections that i have <clears throat> this tenderness toward the things of god <clears throat> it develops in up us <clears throat> a certain disposition does it not i hope it does i hope it uh develops in us, and I might use the word propensity, I don't know if that actually goes here, to feel to do uh, things towards God, that propensity towards Him and His, and his will and His desires. Um, things of God like holiness. Uh, it should, the more you think about the things of God, the more you begin to think about um, those who've gone before, you think about the Word of God and all it tells us, there should be in us, it should develop a fondness and a desire to be like him. I think it's a preparatory time. We're preparing to meet him one day, are we not? And, and this, I think, is what this is telling us to do. If he then be risen with Christ, if you are saved, if you've accepted him as your personal Savior, then, what? Uh, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. So seek those things, and then set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. It's a complete turning. Before we were saved, we're going toward these things. I'm seeking after a nicer house. I'm seeking after a nicer car. I'm seeking after this and after that. And I have set my affections on those things. Because that's the goal. He says, now your goal's changed. You need to seek to please God. Seek to see people come to know God. Seek to get my life clean and right before God. Set my affections on him and those things that will please him. Because one day I'm going to meet with him. <clears throat> and so I do think this is, uh, this is uh, what we need to do. If any uh, is in Christ, they need to be, uh, try to grow like him. Um, is that an easy job? To grow into Christ likeness? Who said something? Y'all speak so soft. It's very hard for me to hear. I said sometimes it's a struggle. I think you're right. I think it's always a struggle. It's always a challenge. And I'm going to get into that in a second, why it is. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, I, 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 I don't. The, the world has all these glittering um, baubles and, and, and whatever you want to call them. I forget what I was calling them before, but anyway, these 
little oddities that we, we're drawn to. Um, they, they're, they're bright, they're glittering, and, and they draw us to them. And God commands his children. He said, you need, to, you need to stop looking at those things because they're temporal. They're not going to last long. When you leave this wor- world, they're not going to go with you. You're not going to take any gold. I got enough asphalt up there. You can leave that here. I don't need any more paving done. He said, you, you, don't ha- you got to look at things different. You got to look at things with new eyes. You got to have a new heart. You got to see the world the way I see it. You got to see people the way I see them. And I think God sees everybody, every soul on earth as a soul, not, not so much as a, as a, a hardcore person. Or a, they're all sinners saved by grace, but I think He sees the soul, the need of that person to come to know Christ for an eternity with Him. And I think that's important. We need to come to that as well. Um, <clears throat> a new way of seeing the world. When you seek those things above, when you set your affections on the things of uh, above, I think what God is, is growing in you is the ability to see the world and everything in the world through his eyes. And we know as we grow away from and separated from this world and are separated to him, the closer we get to him, the better we can see things and understand things as he does. And, and that's important for us. Because right now, you're still living in a body that's not redeemed. Um, What happens if you don't uh, develop spiritual sight? And this is an old one we've talked about this before. What happens if we do not have or do not develop our ability as Christians, that spiritual sight? Well, if you don't develop spiritual sight, how do you know the difference between the holy and unholy? How can you see the difference between the righteous and the unrighteous? If you don't develop spiritual sight, how can you see your life and the things you need to change as God sees it? I mean, spiritual sight is is really very, very important. To be able to see things, to have the mind of God, uh, all these are very, very important things. We need to develop that discernment. Um, And I think it starts by these first two commandments, to seek and to set. Think on godly things. Develop a mind able to discern discern the things of God, to walk with Him. Now, what else does spiritual sight keep you from doing? It keeps you from falling into sin. It keeps you from being caught up in every temptation. Because if you see things the way God sees them, you'll understand. Oh, wait a minute. If I do this, this is going to happen. This is not pleasing to God. This is going to cause a hindrance to my walk with Him. And so you can walk around that entrapment. Um, I wrote this down as the last sentence here. Um, it said, and I wrote it like this. If anything is able to affect one's spiritual walk, this thing is, a, is also able to affect their relationship with God. Whatever is available to affect your spiritual walk will affect your relationship. And so without spiritual sight, these things can cause you to trip up. I think what he commands is very vital. So let's go on to three. <clears throat> it says, uh, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. So in one and two, the way I see this, and, and, and I'll just put it like that, we have the commands of what God wills for each believer to apply themselves uh, these things he wants to apply to us or we to apply to ourselves. And in three, now we have God's reasoning presented, I believe. So in one and two, these are commandments. And then he says, do these things, do these things. And says, why? Why? Because you're dead. You're, you're dead and your life is hid with Christ. Now, notice that last uh, sentence uh, when it says your life is hid where? It doesn't say in Christ, does it? With Christ in God. And I find that very important. We had gone through that before in another uh, chapter, I think, maybe not even in this book, about with God, with God, with I mean with Christ, always with Christ, which I thought was very important. Um, so not only um, uh, are we to seek and set things above, uh, excuse me, I said not only, we are to seek and set our affection on things above because we're dead to this world. So I have to ask myself, why is there such an appeal to these things? Why am I so uh, drawn toward these things? 
Well, we are supposed to be dead, right? So in death, what happens? We're separated from our what? Flesh. Somebody said something? Flesh. We're separated from our flesh, which separates us from everything that's found in the flesh. What's found in the flesh? Emotions, hatred, anger. We go back into Galatians and we can see the fruit of the Spirit, right? The fruit of the flesh, if you would. We're separated from those things, or we should be. But we're having a hard time with that. Um, so, but we are hidden Christ. In, I go back, I, I just want to re- refer back one moment to this. Um, where is it at? I am... Okay, I, I missed it. I, I should have went back to 1 in chapter 3. I went to 1 in chapter 2. Uh, it says, uh, go back to where it says, And Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. We are hidden Him in the heavenly places. Specifically, we're hid on the right hand of, of God. We are in, we're with Christ in God. Christ is where? He's in the heavenlies. He's on the right hand of God. He's a place of authority. Uh, I look at this and I think, man, you know, of all the places to be, what better place to be? What reason do I have to change? You know, this is, uh, this is so, uh, so great a reason to change. If I am dead, if I have all these things that are appealing to me, I now have a great reason to change. I am with Christ, and I'm also in God. Wow, what security. This is telling me there are some things that believers should have died to. Uh, there should be no desires of our own to reveal um, uh, our own flesh, or uh, we should not. Uh, well, let me go back and just talk some common things. We should um, we should not be involved in the things of this world. We should not be dressing uh, wickedly. We should not be speaking wickedly. We should not be acting like unbelievers or those who reject God's word. Uh, these are things that God says you are dead to. You don't have any more business. This is part of the world. This is part of the flesh. You're dead to these things. So, if that's true, if we're dead to these things, should we not be able to ignore them? Should we not be able to control our emotions? Should we not uh, uh, be more cautious of how we dress? Now, let me just ask you this, huh? I think I can do it safer here tonight. <clears throat> Some situations you probably couldn't, but who you dress for? Who do you dress for? If you're with Him, <clears throat> if you're with Christ, how, how, how should you dress? How should we carry ourselves? How should our speech be? If you're with Him, if you're with Him in God, you see, there, there's some things, uh, to me, I see some expectations. You know, these things affect us, but why they affect us? If we're dead, once dead, how are these effects felt? <clears throat> well, I beat all around the bush, and let's just talk about it now. These things are felt because your body's not dead, is it? Your body is alive in its flesh. It's, it, it's, it was born into corruption. It's still in corruption. So what we're in the midst of is a battle. It's a battle of the physical man and the spiritual man. That's what we're talking about. It says, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. So how do we win the battle? How can we live our life like verse 3 is talking about? These are not hard things. These are easy things. I'm not trying to trick you. These things you should know. How can you win the battle? Yes, sir. I fully agree. Anybody else? Walking his word. Read, read his Being word. his word. Walking with him. You have one? Okay. Um, <clears throat> there was an old um, uh, saying that said you have to feed. 
you have two dogs, you have to feed the dog, you want to be stronger. So, uh, if you look at the, the spiritual man and the physical man, you have to pay attention to what you're feeding. If you want your, your, your if you have a baby and you want your baby to grow up strong, you can't always give them chocolate and suckers. That doesn't, that doesn't build the bones, it doesn't build the body, it doesn't give anything for the muscles to feed on. And so there's a, there's a physical body, you have to feed it with the right foods. Now, the thing about kids is they don't always like the right foods. They'd rather have the candy and the ice cream, you know, the, those things that taste so good, chocolate. Ladies never got over that, did they? Chocolate. Huh? I'm just picking. But you understand, there's things we like that are not good for us. Is, you understand what I'm saying? Chocolate's good for you. <clears throat> well, the point is, I'm not going to fight that. Um, the point is, we desire a lot of things for our earthly body that are not good for it. We desire a lot of things spiritually that are not good for us. And when I say spiritually... Everything in the physical world will affect you. So you, you love the wrong music, will it affect you spiritually or not? You want to go to the wrong places with the wrong people, will it affect you spiritually or not? The Bible says iron sharpeneth iron. Do you understand in that precept, in that principle there, there's one thing that's the common. What's the common denominator? Iron. Iron. Versus iron. Christian versus Christian. Sharpen each other. Christian versus an unsaved person. No, 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 no. Totally different ball game. It doesn't work that way. Iron sharpeneth iron. So we need to be around brothers and sisters that are growing in Christ. And we need, uh, hopefully, to talk about the things of God. And those things that bring these things out in us. Um, <clears throat> so we need to look to, spirit, to, to strengthen the spiritual man over the physical. Because only then will you be able to bring your body under control. Self-discipline. Uh, why do I say self-discipline? Say again. Um, there's also another word for that, but I can't remember what it is right now. But you can use self-control yeah, self if you want. Discipline. You need to like. You have to have that desire not to do those things. That's but true. Well, actually, I'm going, to, I'm going to go against you to a degree here, okay? Uh, and I may be wrong, but let me just explain how I see it. If you're going to grow in Christ, if you're going to grow in your spiritual walk, you yourself have to will yourself to read the Bible. Now, that's where self-discipline comes in. So I will myself to read the Bible today. Okay, but what about tomorrow? I have to will myself to do it tomorrow. And that produces, as we do that each and every day, and I say same time, systematically, start one place and read through the Bible, that produces in us a habit. It also produces a character trait. It is a discipline that is hard uh, to, to develop. Now, as you do that, here's where I'll agree with you. As you do that, and as you will in yourself to do that, God will begin to give you the strength and he will help you do it more. But you've already established that. Um, and here's the principle I use for that. That um, where I am weak, he is strong. So I have to make a determination. I can sit over here all day and just say, you know, come on, God, make me stronger in the spirit. Da, 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 da. But if I'm never reading my Bible, if I'm never applying myself, it's not going to happen. But if I use my will and begin to discipline myself to walk with God and to pray then God's going to help me. Because in those weak moments, God's going to say, you know what, we need to meet this morning, you know. And he's going to help me. And he's going to bring me back around. He's going to give me the aptitude, the desire, whatever you want to call it, to meet with him. So partly I disagree with you, and partly I agree. But we do have a responsibility to say it's all of God would remove our responsibility. You know, God, if you wake me up, I'll do this. Really? You know, God, if you will bring somebody by in a car, I'll get to church today. Really? You know, you, you, we all, all have to, not like we all have to put in the work. Yeah. Into what we want to get out of it. So it's like if we're working for God, 
You can strengthen us to... Fully agree. But it's like your garden. You, you put your garden in, you plant your, your seeds, maybe you plant them in the greenhouse, and then you bring them out, you drop them in the furrows, and you say, okay, you're done, go. What happened? You died. Why? Well, wait a minute now. Where was the tending and the, 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 the tender care? And <clears throat> so, yeah, it's both ways, Bruce. I, I mean, well, Eric. When, when you're asking well, self-discipline versus there's discipline by God, but there's also imposed discipline. Which what do you mean by imposed? Well, if you're like in some kind of institution. Okay, like yeah, a yeah. Jail or a school or sure. a university. And they, so then you've got imposed discipline. So you do it, military or whatever. But then when you're on, on your own, what, did you get the self-discipline? Because imposed discipline is different from self-discipline. Yeah, well, now I'm glad you mentioned that because that's somewhat what I talked about, about conforming and then being transformed. Yeah. They give me the, the pattern, and I had to make that my own. It's like bringing your children uh, to church. You bring your children to church, this is what I believe, and they sit under it. But one day... They're going to have to make that decision to make it. They can conform now. But one day they'll come to an age when they'll make the decision. Either they're going to be transformed. This is going to be what they believe. Or they're going to go on their own separate ways. And so the purpose for imposed discipline, just like it was in school with those rules, is to teach us the way in which we should walk. When we have raise our children up, if we spank them when they do wrong, we're teaching them the way you're going is wrong. I'm imposing this discipline because I want you to walk the right way. Now, that's proper, you know, discipline. But, yeah, I agree. There's two different things. Because once you impose it, that doesn't mean that person is going to pick it up and run with it later. Not at all. Ray, did you have your hand up? Oh, yeah. Yeah, like 30 minutes ago. Okay. So All right. Because, you know, I, I, mean, I, mean, if I need Daisy to be able to read the Bible. And that's not intrinsic. Yeah. And right. Self-discipline. Right. I need yeah. to be able to do that. But I tell you what, if she whops you on the head enough, you might desire to do it on your own. But that's the whole idea. If you understand, the whole idea is, is when they impose that discipline is to get you to see. Well, this is the way. I remember when I went through college, they taught all about. Um, um, uh, uh, doctrines and stuff. And I had all the doctrines in my classes and stuff. When I got out, somebody said, name the doctrines. I was like. So I had to stop because it wasn't on top of my head. While I'd been taught them and believed them, when you asked me, I couldn't, I couldn't listen. So I had to go back and study through to understand that. So I'd gotten all that knowledge in, but I really didn't fully understand it. So all everything they put me in, give me in college, was the path that I should walk in order that I could gain the knowledge I needed. It really didn't. It gave me a lot of stuff, but it didn't. I didn't under, I still didn't fully grip it. It took a while. It really did. And the more I was in the Word of God, I've told people this before. This was the place that changed my walk with God, because I went from a person who taught Sunday school and had youth groups to preaching. And when we come in here, we started four sermons every week. And boy, oh boy, this old boy stayed nothing but hemmed up in the corner studying because it was such a drastic change. But it was so good for me spiritually. It was tremendous for me. And I'm going to have to stop. I'm not going to get through three. But I've already, I'm already nickel into your 15 cent. So um, uh, any other comments before we close? All right, Vera, if you'll shut that down.